Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome along to First Tamar Presbyterian Church as we meet together now for our evening service of worship. The announcements, as they were this morning, just to remind you of a couple of things. The first thing is this. If at this time you're still in self-isolation, you're still um, in lockdown because of uh, COVID-19, if you need the help with the picking up of shopping, if you need mail post it, if you need a friendly phone call, urgent supplies, perhaps a prescription, or any of the practical matters that, that you might need just for day-to-day -day living, please don't forget to get in touch with me should you need any of those things. Or if you need spiritual help at this time, it is a delight to be able to speak to you at this time, to be able to provide you with a Bible or gospel literature, or just even to, to, phone, to give you a phone call or to pray with you. Um, please don't forget that on Tuesday night, our prayer meeting will meet via Zoom. This week, it will meet at half past seven, half an hour of the earlier time, as it normally does whenever the congregational committee meets. And so this Tuesday night at half past seven, we'll meet together to pray. And then at half past eight, if you're a member of the congregational committee, we're going to meet via Zoom um, to try and expedite just some matters of business that might need to be attended to at this time. So we're going to use technology to our advantage as we meet via Zoom. I think those are all the announcements that I want to mention just at this stage. The psalmist says in Psalm number 84, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing, they sing for joy to the living God. Let's just praise. We praise God and song.
we're going to be continuing to lock down and lock in with Joseph. Last Lord's Day evening, we looked at Genesis chapter 43, and we thought about Jacob. And Jacob's speaking of mercy to the brothers who were about to come into the presence of Joseph. And tonight we're going to look at the second two points. As they come into contact with the steward, as they come into contact with Joseph himself. Let's read together Genesis chapter 43. And as we do so, we are conscious as always that this is God's word to us. Now the famine was severe in the land. And when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go again, buy us a little food. But Judah said to him, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you, if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Israel said, Why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man you had another brother? They replied, The man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, Is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was an answer to these questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, Bring your brother down? And Judah said to Israel his father, Send the boy with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would now have returned twice. Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags. Carry a present down to the man. A little balm, a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double the money with you. Carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise. Go again to the man. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man. And may he send back your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. So the men took this present and they took double the money with them and Benjamin. They arose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Bring the men into the house and slaughter an animal and make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon. The man did as Joseph told him and brought the men to Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house. And they said, it is because of the money which was replaced in our sacks the first time that we are brought in so that he may assault us and fall upon us with, with us and make us servants and seize our donkeys. So they went up to the steward of Joseph's house and spoke of him at the door of the house and said, O oh my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food. And when we came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks. And there was each man's money in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it again with us. And we have brought other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. He replied, peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. And when the man had brought the men into Joseph's house and given them water, and they had washed their feet, and when he had given their donkeys fodder, they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon. For they heard that they should eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present that they had with them and bowed down to him to the ground. And he inquired about their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They said, Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried out, 
for his compassion grew warm for his brother, and he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out, and controlling himself, he said, Serve the food. They served him by himself, and then by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat with the, with the Hebrews. That is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in amazement. Portions were taken to them from Joseph's table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. Amen. We thank God for his word to us this evening. So last week, Joseph, sorry, Jacob, their father, as he spoke to the brothers of Joseph, spoke of a, of a powerful mercy. A mercy that is powerful, that comes from El Shaddai, the all-powerful God mentioned here in Genesis 43. But now, we're going to be thinking about their interaction with the steward in Joseph's home. So the brothers have left their father Jacob. They have left Canaan. Their father has told them to go again to Egypt to buy more food. We read that in Genesis 43 verses 1 and 2. Go again to buy a little food. And Jacob has acquiesced and allowed them to take their younger brother Benjamin with them in order to acquire food. So the brothers go to Egypt. They have um, come across the, the Sinai Peninsula down into the Nile Delta. They've passed some of the ancient monuments, perhaps even the pyramids themselves. And Joseph, their brother, Zephneth Paniah, the prime minister, the grand vizier, the second in charge of Egypt, the leading world superpower, the, the provider of food, is asking them to come to his residence, his own private residence, his house, to eat. And so no doubt anxiety and fear and perplexion begin to creep in. I'm sure they're not quite sure what's going to happen. And the steward speaks. Verse 23. He replied, peace. Jacob was a powerful mercy. But the steward is is speaking of a peaceful mercy. Peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. He comforts them. He has perhaps been able to look deeply into their eyes and see the perplexion and the anxious look that has crept across their faces. The Egyptian steward brings up the name of Jehovah in Egypt. Peace to you and do not be afraid, your God. Your God. The Hebrew God. He brings up the name of their God in Egypt. And the God of your father, he says. I wonder how he knows about their God. Well, my view is this, that Joseph has been evangelizing. Joseph, even here in the courts of Egypt, has been sharing news and stories and uh, sharing his faith in the covenant-keeping Lord and God. Even in pagan Egypt, even as they worship Pharaoh and Ra and Isis and Osiris, Joseph is telling them of his God. And not only did Joseph tell him But the steward seems to be impressed. Impressed with the God of Jacob. Impressed with the God of Joseph. Actually, we know this. Um, Again, if we are to turn to the book of Psalms, Psalm 105, verses 21 and 22 read this. We'll read from verse 20. The king sent him and released him. The ruler of the people set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to bind his princes at his pleasure 
and to teach his elders wisdom. This is speaking of Joseph. Verse 17, Joseph, who was sold as a slave, his feet were hurt with fetters, his neck was put in a collar of iron. We looked at this portion when we thought about Joseph in prison. And here we can use this portion again as we think about Joseph here in Pharaoh's court teaching Pharaoh's elders wisdom. The book of Proverbs tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Whether Joseph was teaching, evangelizing, being missional, whatever word you want to insert there, he is being faithful in his proclamation of who God is and what he has done to those around him. Even, no doubt, as he felt closed in, in this pagan land, even as we feel closed in, locked in, are there ways that we can evangelize, be missional, be teaching those in our household, those via social media, those that we come into contact with perhaps as we are out doing those essential tasks. And there's a difference in the steward, verses 20, 21, and 22. He listens to them. He is being calm in how he listens to them, in how he observes them, and in how he speaks to them. And then he speaks, and he speaks peace, peacefully to them. Actually, he says, shalom, shalom, peace be to you. It's a Hebrew greeting. Peace, mercy be to you. Again, like when Jacob spoke, there was mercy. As God is continuing to reveal sin in the lives of the brothers to bring them to repentance, it's mercy. And Jacob speaks mercy, and now we see the steward speaking mercifully to this band of brothers. There's mercy here. Do not worry. Comfort to you. There's comfort for you at the minute. He doesn't go into detail, but reminds them of their God and of the God of providence. He gave you the treasure in your sacks, he says. He gave you the treasure in your sacks. It's providence. This is the finger of God. He sees God in this. So should you. The servant reminds you of the God that you should be serving. He reminds the brothers of the God they should be serving. My goodness, their ears. Their ears are about to be burnt off them. Their ears are about to jump out of their heads. The steward having been privy to Joseph's motives, he sees the overarching finger of God in all of this. He sees providence. He sees God. He, this heathen, this pagan, in the land of paganness, points the brothers to the Almighty, to El Shaddai, the almighty, merciful, covenant-keeping Lord and God. He points them to his sovereignty. His hand is what you need to see. Basically, the steward is saying here to the brothers. Do you see this? We thought this morning with the young people about beholding your God. Behold your God. As it says in the book of Isaiah. Behold your God. We need a big view of God at this time. We've been seeing it through this story and we need it today. A big view of God. Behold your God. This steward, whether he believes in his heart in Jehovah or not, if you like, he's showing Christian love, Christian compassion, Christian concern to these Hebrews. Is he a converted man? Maybe. But there's gracious words of comfort amidst their anxiety. Oh, how it's God-centered. And he goes and prepares the feast that Joseph has told him to do. He releases Simeon. God is still moving to bring repentance. 
How? Well, a few C's again. Again, we come back to confession. He was his confession of God and the God of their father. Their father. Again, is this pricking within them their conscience? This man who they've hurt for 20 years. They've gone against him and against the God of their father. They feel guilty. Perhaps there's guilt here again in the place. We've thought about this before. In the place of Egypt. Mentioning their father again. Is your father well? The steward says. Sorry, Joseph will say this, say this later on. We'll talk about, it, about their father. They feel guilty. And that's why they tell the steward everything. Verses 21 and 22. They're scared as they sit now in Joseph's house. They can't help it. Actually, they're not used to kindness. They're not used to grace. They're not used to love. These are hardened men. And we've read of some of the atrocious deeds, the dastardly deeds that these guys have been involved in. And these guys are not used to kindness or grace or love or mercy or compassion. They're used to being rough and gruff as they threw Joseph into the cistern, as they thrust the the blood-covered, beautifully ornate robe into their father's arms, as they killed the Shechemites. These are gruff, rough men. They're not used to people being kind and loving and gracious with them. And I suppose they're thinking to themselves, why are you doing this to the steward? And even as they recall Zephneph Paneah, why is Zephneph Paneah doing this? I wonder if you ever wondered why perhaps we see so few people coming to the Lord. Could be in this place. Could it be that people don't see grace and kindness and compassion and love in us? I mean, these brothers are mesmerized by the love and the kindness and the grace and the mercy of the steward. Do people see something of the compassion, the passion for Christ and the compassion for people in us? Do they drive them to the Savior? Maybe not. Maybe it's something that we need to work on. Our love and our compassion and our kindness and our grace. Clothing ourselves in the fruit of the Spirit that we read of in the book of Galatians. Maybe people don't come to the Lord because they actually can't believe that this is what they find in God. They don't deserve kindness or grace or love or compassion. Or so you think. Here is a steward, and we see grace and love and kindness with no strings attached. No requirement. He's not asking them for payment. He's not asking them for anything in return. And that's God. He showers grace and love and kindness onto each of us. There's no catch. There really isn't any catch. There aren't any strings attached. There's no conditions. There's no sign on the dotted line. There's no fine print to read. Jesus is the true and better steward. With Satan there are catches. There's small print. Actually, before lockdown, when we thought about Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden... Satan tries to tell Eve that that's the case with God. He doesn't want you knowing good and evil, so eat the fruit. He tries to make out that there are catches of God. There aren't any. There are with him, but there aren't with God. We don't need to doubt God or his love or his promises. And that's these brothers feel that perhaps they're about to be falsely accused by Joseph. Actually, like they did with Joseph in Genesis 37, when Joseph came, when Joseph came to observe the brothers, they called him a dreamer and a spy. Actually, we don't, actually, we don't even read that, that Joseph said he was coming to spy on them. 
they accused him of being the spy. He was just bringing greetings from their father. Still more bringing sin. Sin to the fore. Verse 25. They prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon. They heard that they should eat bread there. Uh, They're nervous. They're fidgety. They're tidying up their sacks. They're rearranging their pistachios and their almonds. They're setting out their myrrh and their balm and their spices and all these things that they've brought. Maybe perhaps setting up the money and little tiny towers of coin. They're fidgety. They're trying to impress. But they're nervous. And so they tidy up. And that's not the way to approach Zephneth Paniah. Joseph, and it's not how we approach the true and better Joseph, Jesus himself. Not in our own effort, but in beholding him and realizing that he is one of mercy and of love and compassion and grace. Peace to you, the steward says. Peace to you, there's charity. They're brought into Joseph's home, their donkeys are fed. They're washed. Their feet are washed. There's hospitality with all of the trainings. With the prime minister, the second in control, the grand vizier, the grand duke of all Egypt. I wonder were they still in their minds replaying 20 years ago. They feast as Joseph cried in the pit in Genesis 37. Remember they got out their sandwiches and their wee pot of tea and they had a party while Joseph cried. And here they do exactly the same. They feast while Joseph's in another, another, room, another room weeping. I wonder if they're still thinking of Jacob and El Shaddai. Have mercy. Did they think that God had heard? Did they think that God had heard their dad? God is everywhere, convicting them. Psalm 139, we thought of it this morning, in our rising and in our going to bed. Have you ever tried to run away from God? Yeah, you have. I have. Maybe not in as most dramatic state as, as Jonah did, but we do. We creep around in darkness and in the cover of night, in the shadows. We try to run away and think that we're outside of the gaze of the Almighty. And you will meet him. Because he's everywhere. This is the Prince of Peace. Trust him. Shalom. Peace. God is bringing them to repentance. And we see that in the peaceful mercy that the steward speaks. And lastly, we see that the brothers come into contact with Zephneth Paniah himself. With Joseph. And here Joseph speaks mercy as well. Oh, Joseph speaks of a gracious mercy. So Joseph's announced. And what do the brothers do? Well, in fulfillment of Genesis 37 again. Oh, how they protest it way back that they would never bow to Joseph. Here they do just that. They bow. They bow to Joseph. We won't bow. Now, yes, they will. Joseph, verse 27, inquires of them. How are you? Just like he did way back in Dotham, in Genesis 37, when they falsely accused him. And your dad, your elderly dad, how is he? In other words, in the Hebrew it reads, does your elderly father have shalom? In other words, does your old dad have peace? Peace. Father. Peace. For 20 years he hasn't. They're cast back in their minds to Jacob holding the bloodstained ornately decorated robe. In Genesis 42, or the last portion that we studied together, read of Jacob saying that he would go down into the grave of grey hair, a sad man. Benjamin is now far away from their dad. Look that he's sitting at home. Thinking about them in Egypt and about Benjamin. Will Benjamin come home still lamenting the loss of Joseph? 
Benjamin's away from home now too because of us. Perhaps the brothers are thinking we have caused our father some heartache. Genesis 38. Judah and his daughter-in-law. Oh, the genocide of the Shechemites. Joseph. Now Benjamin. Reminder. Conviction. And yet Zephneph Paniah. Joseph. Points us to the true and better Joseph again. To Jesus. The Lord Jesus himself. As he says. God be gracious to you. Again this stranger. This Egyptian official. Who they would have assumed. Would have worshipped Pharaoh. The son of the gods. Would have run to the shrines of Osiris and Isis. And the Egyptian deities. The stranger is talking about their God. El Shaddai mentioned earlier on. Elohim, the covenant keeping Lord and God. And they have refused to rely on this God. And yet this stranger is talking about him. And in verse 33, what does Joseph do? He sets them out. He sets them from oldest to youngest. Now, I'm no mathematician, but I know there are some math teachers who watch in. But the probability of being able to take 11 people and seating them from oldest to youngest, without knowing them, is 1 in 39 million of a chance. And he sat them from oldest to youngest. That's what it says here. Wow. And what does it say the brothers did? They marveled. Any wonder. They marveled at one another. Wow. He knows us. And he gave five times the amount of food as any of the other brothers to Benjamin. Five times the amount of turkey. Five times the amount of vegetables. Five times the amount of roast potatoes. What's he doing? He's testing the brothers. Will they be jealous? Had they changed? Had they been convicted? And as they speak their last words, he's reassured. He doesn't see jealousy. He doesn't see anything of their former lives. There's great progress. They make less of self. That's the Christian life, isn't it? Less of self and more of God. How we must decrease and Christ must increase. They're being prepared for Joseph's great revelation later on in the book of Genesis. God can convict and convert anyone. He works through providence and we fall at his feet. Has that happened to you? He can do it. He can do it for you. No matter who you are. No matter where you've been hiding or trying to run to. God can convict and convert you. He provides a saviour. This is a picture of the true and better Joseph, a picture of Jesus. There's mercy. Merciful Joseph gives a feast to these brothers. He doesn't pursue evil for evil, but he steps out and steps in in love. The Hebrew word for mercy here shows Joseph, it basically means his bowels were moved. He was heated up in mercy. As he looked at his brothers. And he went. And he wept. The brothers didn't see his tears. But don't forget. As we think of the true and better Joseph. We know of one who did weep. He wept over Jerusalem. They didn't see. Joseph's tears. But we have seen the tears of Christ. For us. We know the true and better Joseph, don't we? It's Jesus. So let's just close now with prayer. Let's pray together. Our Father, as we have looked this evening at the subject of mercy, mercy in Genesis 43, we see, Lord, that if we are a Christian person this evening, that we are recipients of this mercy. And if we're not... Lord, how we can be and 
really, Lord, we should be asking the question, what is stopping us from coming and receiving such mercy as we come as we are, with no prearranged condition? Father, may we this week understand and recognize and thank you for the so great mercy that you have shown to us. Lord, as we see all of these little providences in the story of Joseph, we thank you, Lord, for these chapters because these chapters continually remind us of ourselves and our own state and our own condition. It's easy, Lord, to look and see the character of Joseph and that's what we've been doing. And so often we think about the story of Joseph It's a story that resonates with us. But yet, in typology, we see that Joseph is a type of Christ. And so if we are in this story, if we read ourselves into this story, we don't read ourselves as Joseph. We read ourselves as the brothers. We are the brothers that need to come and buy. We are the brothers that need to come and receive. We are the brothers that need to come and repent. And we are the brothers that need to come and experience mercy. And so El Shaddai, God of mercy, we thank you for the mercy that we have in Jesus. As we behold our God this day, we see him as a God of mercy. And may such mercy go before us today and into the week ahead. And may grace, mercy and peace from God our Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.